Please open your Bibles to Psalm 56. We're taking a break on our series through Genesis to spend this summer in the book of Psalms. And we've made that a habit of ours for, I don't even know how many years now, eight years maybe, something like, something like that. And so it's just been a joy and delight. We, some of us have a method uh, to the Psalms we pick, uh, others n- maybe not as much. We just pick a psalm and preach it. And so uh, you'll get to hear over the summer uh, a number of the different psalms. And as always, I think you'll find that they are incredibly refreshing, incredibly encouraging, incredibly helpful. And so the psalm that we get to look at this morning is no different. So let's read the word of God together. This is Psalm 56. If you grab the Bible in front of you, that should be on page 476 in the Pew Bible. Psalm 56. The word of God reads, To the choir master, according to the dove on the far off terebinths, a miktam of David, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Be gracious to me, O God, For man tramples on me. All day long an an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. For many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape. In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling. That I may walk before God in the light of life. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are God that we can run to and take refuge in. That you are a God that we can call on. A God whom we can pray to. That you are near, Lord, and you delight in answering and you delight in delivering. You're God who hears our cries for mercy and our pleas for grace. Lord, you are our God in every season. You are our God in every trial. You are our God in every difficulty. You are our God in every terrifying moment we face. And we understand, Lord, that we do not face a single one of them without you, without your awareness, without your sovereign hand orchestrating it. Lord, even when we are being trampled without end, you are our God. So Lord, make us strong in faith. Help us to learn from David's example in this psalm. Teach us, Lord, to triumph when we are being trampled. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus 
said in John 6, 33, that I have said these things to you that in me you have, that in me you may have peace. And then he says, in the world you will have tribulation or trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In Luke 12, 32, Jesus says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What do you do when you're afraid? What do you do when what you're facing is absolutely terrifying? What, what do you do? What is it? What has been your habit when you're trying to navigate overwhelming feelings of dread and disaster? What do you do when you're pressed in, when you feel caught, even seized, and on the brink of death? What should a Christian do in those situations? How should a Christian respond? What is the way forward when all you see around you is darkness? David's way forward in the midst of paralyzing fear was simple yet profound. It was faith in God. Trusting in God even when he is being trampled. The fear of man and death for David at this moment was, I think, as high as it ever could be at any moment of his life. And while for maybe some of us, we haven't really experienced a moment like this yet, others of you no doubt have. But wherever you are, however close you can identify with David, it's important for all of us to learn the lessons that David can teach us because the time will come when we, all of us, will face moments like this. And the way for us to overcome fear and terror is to triumph by trusting in God. At this point in David's life, he knows that God has promised him to be king, but he's not king yet. He knows that God has promised to give him the kingdom, even though Saul is the current king. And David has seen God deliver him many times before. But none of that takes away the difficulty or the dread of the deadly situation that he has found himself in when he pens this psalm. And so I think that we have a lot that we can learn from David here so that we can be ready so that we can have a plan of defense even before it comes, that we've thought about this ahead of time, that when I get back into that moment or that experience or that that trial again, I am ready uh, to respond in a way that allows me to conquer the fear with faith. And so the main idea of this psalm is that I want us to see three Fear conquering acts of faith so that we will overcome overwhelming and terrifying trials by trusting in the Lord. So let's begin with the first fear conquering act of faith. The first one, the first fear conquering act of faith needed to overcome terrifying trials is to cast your burden. Cast your burden. Cast your burden on the Lord. When you notice that fear is beginning to overtake you, uh, that's not the time to think, I'll just bear this alone. I'll just try harder. I'll just, I'm just gonna make it. I'm gonna endure. I'm gonna do this. Rather, run to the Lord. Take all of it to him. Make it all known to him. Share the deepest darkest, hardest, heaviest things that you are facing with God. Cast your burden on him. Don't try to bear it yourself. 
You will be crushed underneath the weight of it. If you try to bear it on your own, you have no way in your own weak power to bear that. So you run to God and you cast your burden on him and you do it in prayer. David had that as his habit. And he not only did that in prayer, but he even then turned that into songs as well. And many of the Psalms we're seeing David do exactly that. And that's what he does in our Psalm. What he's experienced, he's not trying to to just manage it on his own. He's running to God in prayer and throwing it all on God. He's saying, Lord, you take it. So he runs to the Lord, he casts his burden on the Lord, and he asks the Lord, verse one, be gracious to me. He calls aloud for God's grace. He doesn't think I'm gonna get through this without your help, Lord, you alone. I need your grace. I need your grace or I will be overcome by these fears. I will, I will lose in this trial. Be gracious to me, O oh God. And that sets the tone for the whole rest of his prayer. Why is he pleading in this moment for God's grace? Because he's trapped, he's locked in, he's caught, he has no way out. God has to make a way out for him. And so he's saying, be gracious to me, O O Lord. I think this is one of the most terrifying moments in David's entire life. Look at how he expresses his, 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 uh, how, how his fear in all that he's experiencing, the burden and distress that he's bearing in this moment. He says, be gracious to me, O God, for man, what? Tramples on me. All day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Can you hear the anguish in his voice? Three times he says, all day long, all the time. This is unceasing. I'm just being crushed, God. They're constantly after me. They hate me. They want to destroy me. They want to tear me to pieces. They want to kill me. They're oppressing and trampling and attacking Verse five to seven, all day long, they they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. All their planning, all their scheming, all their conversations, all all of it is filled with malice toward me, God. They want me dead. They want me crushed. They want me ruined. So they, they stir up strife, he says. They lurk. David's, David's like, he, he, he's like an animal fleeing from its life in the night from a, a prowling lion on the run, just trying to stay alive and not be eaten. He feels hunted because he is hunted at this moment in his life. Saul is pursuing him and chasing him and seeking to destroy him. And so David is taking all this burden and throwing it on the Lord, making it known to God, asking for God's grace, asking for God's help. What was he going through in this moment? Apart from what the anguish of the, you know, the words that he gives us here, uh, we have some more information that helps us to, to, uh, place this psalm at a specific moment of David's life. Did you notice when we began the psalm, it said that it was a miktam of David, which we don't really know for sure what miktam means, maybe inscription or, or the idea of you know, something inscribed. Uh, we don't, we're not sure. But then it says, when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Now, what would be so... Troubling about that situation. If you're not familiar with David or his life or, or the Philistines, you might think, you know, uh, what, what's the big deal here? 
So let me give some background information on, on David and on this situation. Uh, we know that David is first mentioned in the book of Ruth. When you have the end of the book of Ruth, the genealogy goes from Boaz to Perez to Hezron to Ram, Aminadab, Nashon to Salmon to Boaz to Obed to Jesse to David. And so this promised uh, son of Abraham, uh, eventually a king promised through the line of Judah, uh, is, is eventually, uh, from the line of Judah, you have a man named David. And at the time when we're, we are uh, introduced to David, he's just a shepherd boy. And David's not king. In fact, another man is king at that time, and his name is, is Saul. Uh, and if you read the books of First and Second Samuel, you can, you can learn a bit uh, about this. Samuel himself was a, uh, was a judge over Israel, uh, which that was sort of the, um, the, the leadership role before Israel had a king. But what happened was is Samuel grew old and Samuel had sons and the people were like, Samuel, your sons are evil, wicked sons. We don't want them ruling over us. We want a king. We need a king, Samuel. And so please give us a king. And God tells Samuel, okay, we'll warn them of all the difficulties that will come their way if they have a king. And they're like, we want a king anyways. And so uh, he also says, recognize that they're rejecting me as king over them. But go ahead and give them a king. And so this is where Saul is then anointed. And he's the first king of Israel. And this movement happens from judges to a king. But in the course of uh, Saul's life, when he becomes king, uh, he ends up doing a number of things where he uh, does not obey the Lord. God, in the beginning of Saul's uh, ministry as king, gives Saul a number of successful military endeavors. Uh, he goes to war with the Philistines. And so when you read the Philistines, uh, you should be thinking this is one of Israel's first and foremost enemies that they are constantly dealing with. And Saul has some victory over them, but then shows his desire to just do what's right in his own eyes and not in God's eyes. And he ends up disobeying God in a number of points. And Samuel goes and tells Saul, now your kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And at that point, Saul doesn't even know who he's talking about. And shortly after that, Samuel tells Saul, or God tells Samuel to, to communicate to Saul, I regret that I've made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Samuel says to Saul, you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And down in 1 Samuel 15, verse 28, says, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And while Samuel's weeping over this whole situation, God tells Samuel, stop weeping, get up. I want you to go to Bethlehem. I want you to go to the house of a guy named Jesse, and I want you to anoint one of his sons as king. And that ends up being David, who then is anointed to be this next king to have the kingdom, uh, to take the place that Saul uh, had. And he ends up, David ends up becoming Saul's personal musician at first, then eventually his armor bearer, and then eventually uh, because of the battle with the Philistines where Goliath is coming out uh, and taunting them for 40 days, and nobody is willing to go to war and try to step up to Goliath and fight him, David volunteers and goes out uh, and grabs his sling with his stones, and you know the story. He, he swings it, and bam, right into Goliath's head. Goliath falls down. David picks up Goliath's sword, chops off Goliath's head, brings it back to Saul. People are cheering. People are, are dancing. People are singing because of the victory that David brought. Saul kills his thousands. Saul has slain his thousands. But David, his tens of thousands. 
So Saul begins to be jealous and envious of David and hate David uh, and, 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 and begins to try to kill David. He's hurling spears at David and David's fleeing for his life. David has to run from his kingdom and Saul is pursuing him outside uh, of his own kingdom to try to find him and to hunt him down and to, and to kill him. And so David, essentially about seven to 10 years of his life, even though he's anointed king, he's not ruling, he's not reigning, he's just running for his life. And so we get to the point at this situation where David is fleeing from his life from Saul and the place where he has to run to is a place called Gath. Let me remind you that what the text said when Goliath came out to fight against David, it said there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Gath was Goliath's hometown. David's first Philistine he ever killed was Goliath, their greatest warrior. Like a dude's actually a giant. He was their champion. He was their most fearsome warrior. And now David is having to run and flee and hide, and he's in Gath. Not only that, David after that got into a number of different wars with the Philistines uh, and and had slain a bunch of them. Uh, Another thing, Saul tried to get David killed. And so he offered his wife to, or his his daughter as a wife to David and said that on this one condition, you need to go and get 10 or get 100 Philistine foreskins and bring them to me as the bride price. And David goes and Saul's hoping David's gonna go to war and get killed in battle. That's Saul's plan and plot. David and his men go and they come back with 200. Instead, and, and give, gives it to him. And Saul wants to kill him, you know, all, all the more. And so it, it, it may be hyperbole, but, but, or it could be in the, in, the, in the real realm of how many Philistines that David had killed. Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. Now, do you get the context of the place where David has found himself? He is in Gath, Goliath's hometown and they've arrested him. They found him, they seized him, and they bring him to their king. And you can read about this in 1 Samuel 21, verse 10 to 12. This is what it says. It says, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, is this, is not this David, the the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. I mean, if there's one person you want to kill, it's David. It says that David, so t- terrified, so frightful, he ends up changing his behavior before them, pretends to be insane in their hands. This is 1 Samuel 21, verse, uh, verse 11 and following. And made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a, man, a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And then it says next that they, they, they let him go. And he fled into another cave. And then he wrote another psalm. Uh, and that's the next psalm, Psalm 57. Are you starting to see the burden that David had? Starting to understand the turmoil in his heart. Starting to realize that, that he went... Out of the fire, right? What is it? Out of the frying pan, sorry, into the fire. That's the situation in Gath. I think that he most likely pins this right before he's brought before the king. And no doubt is thinking, I'm done. This is the end. I'm about to have my head cut off or be burned with fire. This is Gath of all places. Key town of the Philistines. Kidner says about this, to have fled from Saul to Gath of all places, the hometown of Goliath, took courage, the courage of despair and measured David's estimate of his standing with his people. And now this has failed and he is doubly encircled. This is the weight of his burden. This is the terror that he had. And 
what did he do? He casted his burden on the Lord. In the Psalm right before this, he says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Psalm 55, 22. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. And so David's goal is I'm not gonna be silent. When I am fearful, when I'm facing these trials, I'm gonna cry out to God. I'm gonna throw it all on him. I'm not gonna give in to uh, despair or languish with fear, I'm gonna get busy casting my burden on him. In your most recent trial, when you're fearful, when you're frightened, is that your habit? Do you run to him and do you throw it all on him? Philippians 4 says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Cast your burden on the Lord. This is how you overcome overwhelming trials with overcoming faith. The second fear-conquering act of faith that we want to be ready to employ when we're facing terrifying trials is to consider your God. So we talked about casting your burden And now, consider your God. If you want to triumph when you are being trampled and overcome the fear of man, then you need to consider your God. This is when you just stop and you take moments to really, truly think about God in the situation that you are in, in the situation that you are facing. What are you up against? Who is on your side? What is he like? What has he promised? What has he said? Those are the ways you consider your God. And no doubt the less chance that we think we have of surviving a situation, the more terrifying that situation is for us. The more prone to fear we are. But if in those moments you can really set your minds on the Lord and consider him, then I think that you can find that you will be well on your way to overcoming your fears. So consider your God. Consider your God in four areas. Consider his justice. Consider his mercy. Consider his favor. Consider his power. Let's, let's look at each of these briefly because this is exactly what Daniel or David does. Consider his justice. David asks in verse seven, rhetorical question of the Lord, knowing the answer to it. He says, for their crime, will they escape? When you're struggling, people are attacking you and oppressing you and trampling you. You need to consider God and his justice, that nothing escapes his sight and that he will right every wrong, and that he will call to account every sin, that he will be sure to be a righteous judge. No one is getting off the hook. No one will escape crimes against the Most High. And if you understand that, then you, you, you can begin to overcome your fears. David is certain of God's justice And he's certain that when he calls on God, verse 9, that his enemies will turn back. And the reason that he can have that confidence is because he knows that God is just. Consider also, though, when you're in these moments, his mercy. It's not just God's justice that should be a comfort to you, that he will judge the enemies but also consider his mercy that he, even in the midst of your trials, is continuously pouring out on you. Look, it's just so beautiful how David describes this. Look at verse eight. Look at the mercy of God in the midst of terrifying trials. Verse eight, David says, you have kept count of my tossings. Another way that you could put tossings is... is, is, uh, wanderings, sort of uh, hard to know for sure the, the right way to take that word, but whether tossings, which would maybe be 
How many times you flip side to side on your bed in your anxiety and in your anguish feels endless? Will this ever end? Will I ever get to sleep? Will I ever have peace? Uh, or whether it's just I've been wandering and wandering and wandering and I'm this way and I'm that way and I'm on the run and this thing is happening and now this thing is happening and I have no home and I have no place to lay my head and I'm constantly in a danger in danger and I'm constantly threatened and my life is constantly uh, in, in, in fear of being lost. He has kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? None of, it's, none of it escapes God's notice. None of your pain, none of your suffering, none of your anguish, none of what you suffer is lost on God. He's not ignorant or unaware or, or like busy with other stuff and doesn't see and doesn't care. No, he keeps count, David says here, of my, of my tossings. But not only that, he also, see, he says here, put my tears in your bottle. Do you guys know that David wept a lot? It's okay to cry, amen? You can cry. In this world, you have tribulation. Why do you think in Revelation it talks about wiping tears from eyes? This is, this is not an easy world to live in. If you're making it through this world without weeping, without crying, maybe your heart is hardened. David cried all the time. One time in Psalm 6, he says, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. And so the picture he gives here is put my tears in your bottle. When, when we think of a bottle, we probably think of like a, a glass bottle. But for them, uh, in their day, it would have been more like a wineskin. But the idea, just picturing it, collecting, none of those tears are falling to the ground. God's taking his bottle and is mercifully catching each one of those tears that you drop, that you cry, showing his tender and merciful care for you. What an what a amazingly near and merciful God. You care about the tears I cry. You care about the pain that I experience. You care about the suffering that I'm enduring. And, and you know it all, and you've stored it all up. And you will act, O oh Lord. And you will write this. And you will bring comfort. And you will wipe away every tear. So you've kept count on my, my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? They're written down. God's kept count. He's kept the tears. He's, he's collected the tears. And he's written down all of it. He knows it all. He will reward it all. He will bless it all. He's glorified by it all. And he will comfort you because of all of these things. Do you see his mercy? Do you see his mercy? Do your fears begin to get smaller as you consider the mercy of God? And so consider his justice and consider his mercy and then also consider his power. I love what, what, what David does here uh, at a number of, uh, at two different times uh, in this psalm. Look at, look at the contrast that he gives. So in verse four, he talks about in God, in God, I put my trust. And then he says, what can flesh do to me? And then again in verse 11, he talks about in God, in the Lord, in the Lord, right? I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Man is flesh. Man is weak. Man is grass. Man is dust. Man is ground. Man is dirt. Man is nothing before the Lord. Think about God's power when you're in those moments. The problem that you're facing, how small is it compared to God? I was 
talking to my, my kids about this passage, and I said, I said, Elias, Natty, and Ellie, if you took the biggest, strongest person in the whole world and you put them up against God, the most fearsome warrior, biggest muscles, most terrifying person who's killed the most people ever, and you put that person against God, who's going to win? They're like, God's going to win. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Now, what if you took every single person in the whole world who was like that and the whole world and all their fury with all their power were gathered together against God, who would win that battle? They're like, God would win that battle. That's right. Would it be hard for God? No. It wouldn't be hard for him at all. The comparison is... It's no less laughable whether it's one man or every single man turned against God. God in his power is unapproachable, unimaginable. His will and his power and his hand cannot be thwarted. No one can say to God's hand, stop that. Don't do that. No one can stop God. And so when you think about your fears, you need to consider your God. You need to consider his justice. You need to consider his mercy. You need to consider his power. And then also, you need to consider his favor. And this is what David uh, comes to. And I think that this is really the foundation of everything for him. Verse 9, he says, This I know, this I know, that God is for me. All that justice, all that mercy, all that power, and for me. He's for me. It is what Paul picks up on in, in Romans chapter 8, right? If God is for us, who could be against us? The whole world could be gathered against us. It does not matter. And one day, the whole world will be gathered against him. And it will not matter. He will slay his enemies with the breath of his mouth. He'll bring the most powerful ruler at that time, to nothing by the appearance of his coming. He's for us. These trials we're facing are temporary. They're not eternal. The reigning with Christ part, after the suffering part, that's eternal. He's for us. And how do we know that he's for us? I think that David helps us to understand. One, he says that he trusts in God. He trusts in God. And then also he speaks of God as whose word I praise, whose word I praise. How do you know that you are on God's side? How do you know that God is on your side? Well, you believe in him and you believe what he has revealed about himself. You believe his word. Everything that he has communicated through the prophets, in the scriptures, you believe it all. And you live your life on on that basis. And you have a high view of God. And you have a high view of God shown by a high view of his word. Even if you yourself haven't heard God speak audibly, even if you may have never experienced that, you don't know what it's like for these prophets to have the word of the Lord come to them and speak to them and then write these things down for us. But what you do have is what has been written down for us and your relationship with God then is is seen by how you respond to his word. Do you value his word? Do you cherish his word? Do you praise his word? Do you delight in his word? Does your life show that you love his word, that you're seeking to obey his word, that you want to keep his word? And you know that God's on your side. He's the one who believes in him, he promises will never be put to shame. The one who trusts in God can be certain that God is on his side, that God is for him. Not the one that has perfectly obeyed God. Somebody say amen. Amen. But the one who trusts in God by faith alone in the Lord, he's on your side. And if he's for you, with his justice, with his grace, with his mercy, with his power, with his favor, if his favor's on you, then what can man do to me? What was, he could take my stuff, can kill my 
family, take everything I own, take my life. But that's it. Can't take my soul. And he can't keep God from raising me from the dead. And he can't keep me from reigning with Christ. And he can't keep me from inheriting the kingdom that God has promised to those who are trusting in him. You're going to have to lose everything anyways. So trust in him. Let those fears dissipate. You get to become fearless and bold and courageous because you know what God has promised to you. And you know that these aren't the things to cling to. Christ alone is the one to cling to. And if you cling to him, then you're going to inherit his kingdom. And you're going to have all the rest of the things that God wants to give to you. And you'll live forever, enjoy him forever. But cling to this life. Deny Christ in this life. Seek to establish your own kingdom and reign now by rebelling against God and not obeying his word. And Jesus says that you will be cast out into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You won't inherit his kingdom. You won't reign with him, but you will be cast out. You will be cast down and you will inherit rather than his kingdom. You'll inherit an everlasting punishment in the lake of fire. The scripture is called the second death. What can man do to me? Can man put me in the lake of fire? No. So that's why Jesus says, don't fear man who can just destroy the body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And if you do that, then you can truly live a fearless life knowing what is promised to you. And so when you look then with that confidence at death, at the loss of all these things, you can have an overcoming faith, a faith that overcomes your fears because you're casting them on the Lord and you're considering God and his promises to you. This leads to our last point then, and that is to commit your way. This is the third fear-conquering act of faith Cast your burden, consider your God, and commit your way. Commit your way to the Lord. It's, it's true that, you know, you're saying, I, I trust God, I put my faith in him, and, uh, and I do that all the time. I've done that already, right? Yes, you, if you're a believer in Jesus, you have done that already. That is true. But when you are in these moments, when it gets this hard, when it gets this difficult, when you're looking death in the face, that is also a moment to continue and to do it again, to commit yourself to the Lord. So when do we commit? I'm gonna ask a few questions here. Who do we commit our way to? When do we commit our way? Who do we commit our way? How do you commit our way? What is that? What are we committing? So let's think about a few of these. When do we commit our way to the Lord? If you look at verse three and four, David says what? When I am afraid. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. You need to make a conscious effort that even though I'm afraid here, Lord, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to suffer whatever it is that you see fit to come my way, and I'm going to do it for you, Lord. I commit this moment, I commit this instance to you, God. Let me glorify you. So commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in him. Uh, who do you commit your way to? Right here it says, it's to the Lord. This is, this is God himself. We're committing to him. We're not gonna forsake him. We're not gonna get angry or, or mad at him, but we're going to trust him. He is the Lord. We are his servants. We're here to serve him. We're here to glorify him. However he sees fit with our, this weak vessel, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. And so you commit your way to him. And then also we 
the way you commit your way to him is simply by trusting. Trusting in him. I love the story in the book of Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Most of you know that story. Uh, but there, I think, a great example uh, of what it looks like to put your trust in the Lord when your life is on the line. Uh, some of, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are uh, made rulers in, in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, and uh, others are jealous of them and want to want Want, want them essentially uh, want to find some fault in them, but they can't because they're so upright and godly. Uh, and so they, they, they're like, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to get the King Nebuchadnezzar to tell people to bow down uh, to these statues. And if they don't worship uh, the, golden, the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar sets up, then they're going to be punished. And so that's the test. And they know that they are faithful Jews who will not worship an image. And so this is all a trap and it's all a scheme to get them killed. And so uh, they, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are brought before Nebuchadnezzar and they are, they're, they're, ne King Nebuchadnezzar is told um, that they have not bowed down. Uh, and then uh, essentially he, he, Nebuchadnezzar's like, well, just do it and you're going to be okay. And they respond, you know, Nebuchadnezzar says, do it, you'll be okay. If you don't do it, you're going to be thrown into the fiery burning furnace. They respond, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so they, the king is angry. He says, crank up the heat seven times what it was. The guys who pick them up and bind them and throw them in end up dying from how hot the furnace is. And the three men are thrown in there. Uh, and then verse 24, chapter three of Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king, he answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. And they end up coming out and Nebuchadnezzar's attitude is completely changed. He says, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who sent his angel, that's the angel of the Lord, and delivered his servants who trusted in him. And do you hear that? And delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any God except their own. What a statement by King Nebuchadnezzar. Acknowledging that these men committed their way to the Lord no matter what it costed them, knowing that God could deliver them. But even if God chose not to deliver them, that they would rather honor God and not worship any other gods. So they entrusted themselves to the Lord. It's an incredible moment, incredible example. And that's exactly the same approach that we need to have. David commits his way to the Lord. And God sees fit to not rescue David in the same way that he rescued those men. It's not as pretty in this instance with David as, you know, not as glorious uh, as, you know, the angel of the Lord walking in the midst of the fire with you. David ends up acting crazy. And it works. And he knows it shouldn't have worked. He knows that. And if you read Psalm 34, you guys probably know this psalm, but did you realize this is the same moment of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and went away. Listen to him erupt in praise after this. I bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces shall never be ashamed. And I love this, my favorite voice. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him 
and saved him out of all his troubles. Look what he says here. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Even though we didn't see a miraculous deliverance, I think David has full confidence that the angel of the Lord was right there, and it was only due to God's power that the king, uh, the, the king said, get this madman out of here. I think David's thinking, I can't believe that worked. It, it didn't. God did it. God rescued him, and it wasn't pretty. Sometimes when you commit your way to the Lord, it's not going to be pretty either. But he's going to bring you through it. And you're going to think, I can't believe I just made it through that. He did that. He did that. May he be praised. May he be glorified. May he be the one that I serve. In Psalm 37, David says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. And one of the last things I want to say here on committing your way to the Lord is one of the things you're committing to doing is in that moment, you are committing to not fear. This shows up twice. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you and God whose word I praise and God I trust, I shall not be afraid. You're like, what? What is, what's going on here when you are afraid? You say that you're going to trust and not be afraid. Yes, that's exactly what it's saying. We're going to be afraid. But in those moments, we run to God and we cast our burden and we consider him, right? And we commit our way to him and we resolve because of all the rest of those things, I will not fear. I will not fear. You may still have some lingering feelings of fear, but you're resolved. You've handled it. I am trusting in the Lord. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? In the end here, uh, we, we see uh, David in verses 12 and 13 speak about making vows to the Lord and rendering thank offerings to him. Uh, and this is further showing his commitment to the Lord, his faith in God. He's fully believing that God will deliver him from this, from this moment. And that the, on the other side of this, essentially peering through death and after God rescues him from death, that he's going to come and he's going to praise God and he is going to thank God for that deliverance. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Mark Futado, in his commentary, writes, David was so confident that God would help him that he vowed to offer God a sacrifice of thanksgiving for the help he was certain he would receive. He was absolutely confident that God would eventually rescue him so that he would once again experience the blessed presence of God, his life-giving light. He's fully anticipating that he will make it through alive now that he's cast his burden, now that he's considered his God, and now that he has committed his way again. The end of the story for the believer is never death. The end of the story for the believer is the light of life. What is the light of life? The light of life is what you are all experiencing right this very moment. You are a living, you are alive, and you are constantly basking in the light of life. And though one day you will die, and though one day your soul will be separated from your body, the Lord Jesus says that if you have believed in him, that though you die, yet shall you live. And in the book of Daniel, it says that, that, that the day is coming when those who are asleep will rise from their graves, some to everlasting shame and contempt, and others to everlasting life. The end of the story for the believer is never the ground. It's not the tomb. It's not darkness. It's not down there. It's life here right on the earth with the Lord. 
And so the temporary and, and uh, deliverances from, from death that we may experience in this life, I have a situation come or like this one with David or when he faced Goliath or when he's in Gath or whatever them they may be, all of those deliverances from death where he didn't actually die, but he came so close to dying are just glimpses of the coming grace of God that we will have when God works a more powerful rescue, when he literally speaks by the power of his spirit and his breath blows and the graves are open and the dead are raised to live forevermore. And that's the hope that you and I have if we're trusting in Christ and if we're trusting in God. The end of the story isn't, isn't down there and it's not darkness and not death, but it's light and it's life forevermore. What can man do to me? Faith alone is the way forward through fear. I love, it's interesting when you think about David's life. He had seven years of suffering, pain, torment, terror, being hunted, running for his life, all before he reigned. All that suffering before his reigning. And I think that gives us a glimpse of what the promised son of David would experience as well. Suffering first, then reigning in glory later. And that's what Peter says. This is what the prophets declared, the sufferings of Christ and then the subsequent glories. We also, I think, get a glimpse for us who are in Christ of what our life is gonna be like and what we are going to experience. It's suffering now, reigning then. This is why Jesus says, pick up your cross, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. This is why he said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But this is also why he said, fear not little flock, for it is the father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. David was waiting for the promise of his kingdom to be fulfilled. And he kept his eyes focused on God and that promise through his suffering and through his trials. We ourselves have been promised a kingdom to reign with Christ for eternity. And those of us who believe in him, we're waiting and we're holding on to that promise by faith. And that is what is to pull us through our trials and what enables us to look straight at death and not have fear. We can be more than conquerors because we are promised that if we endure, we will also reign. Also in the book of Daniel, I love this verse, it says in verse seven, chapter seven, verse 18, that the saints of the most high, this is speaking of the end of the matter, this is what's gonna happen at the end. It says, the saints of the most high shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Later in the verse, chapter seven mentions these four beasts, this vision that Daniel saw, and these four beasts that, meant, that, that uh, symbolize these four coming kingdoms, and they're just devouring and trampling and oppressing the earth. And the final uh, one has this little horn that shoots up, and this horn is a person who it says will prevail over the saints, speaking of the, the coming Antichrist. And Daniel says, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the ancient of days came and judgment was given for the saints of the most high. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole of heaven shall be given to the saints of the most high. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Isn't that glorious? Oh, precious saint, as you live right now and struggle to live a righteous life, as you're hated for Christ, as people want to want to attack you and silence you and trample you and dispose of you, as the whole world is headed toward a time of unprecedented human trial and suffering and persecution, it is clear this now is the time when we suffer. But this suffering is soon coming to an end. 
our trampling is coming to an end. And our responsibility is to overcome that, this, this time of trampling with triumphant trust in God, knowing that we will soon reign with him. This is what has been promised to us. And so be encouraged. Be strengthened. Put your trust in him. Do not be afraid. I want to close with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. He comments on the phrase that I may walk before God in the light of life. And he says that I may walk before God in the light of the living, enjoying the favor and presence of God and finding the joy and brightness of life therein, walking at liberty and holy service and sacred communion and constant pro progress and holiness, enjoying the smile of heaven. This I seek after. Here is the loftiest reach of a good man's ambition to dwell with God, to walk in righteousness before him, to rejoice in his presence and in the light and glory which it yields. And he says, thus in this short Psalm, we have climbed from the ravenous jaws of the enemy into the light of Jehovah's presence, a path which only faith can tread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for being such a gracious, merciful, powerful, just, holy, compassionate, loving God. And we thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of your Son and your Spirit and the sure hope that we have of your coming kingdom. Lord, thank you that we are inheriting a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and so, Lord, help us, help us to commit our way to you and to see you act. In every moment, Lord, that we are trampled in every terrifying trial we face, give us grace to overcome with triumphant trust in you, Lord. May this encourage your people. May they know how to respond, O oh Lord, as they experience these things. And may they, Lord, be certain that you are for them. And may they be assured of that, Lord, because they trust in your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.